I didn't want to end my insulin resistance in years. I wanted to end it in days. And the truth is we have the science now to help us do that. I mean, you feel it, right? It's the exhaustion that hits you like a wave after you have a bunch of carbohydrates, right? A meal that's supposed to give you energy. You feel kind of spongy fat around your midsection. It feels different from fat on the rest of your body or fat that you've ever had before. You know that gnawing, incessant craving for carbs that feels less like a choice and quite frankly, more like a desperate need. I was there, I know exactly what it feels like, and now I've spent time in the science. I was told it was a lack of my willpower. I was told that I needed to try harder, and I see it happen to a lot of people now. But what if I told you that it has nothing to do with your willpower? What if it really was more of a microscopic communication breakdown that's happening inside your cells? It's a signal that's getting jammed. It leaves your body completely starving for energy, even though there's plenty of fuel coming in. This is insulin resistance, period. It's not just a precursor to diabetes. It's the single greatest driver of the chronic diseases that place us today. Plain and simple. Today, we're gonna pull back the curtain on the insulin resistance epidemic. We're gonna expose the real difference between insulin resistance and diabetes. And we're gonna explain why your doctor might be missing some of the really simple signs. Second, I'm gonna reveal the new statistics on who really has this and why being lean doesn't really grant you immunity. Then we're gonna go deep into the cell and we're gonna look at the exact mechanisms that are jamming your energy signals. Most importantly, I'm gonna give you a powerful toolkit of actionable steps. I've been really trying to do that lately with my videos and it works really well. So we're gonna include strategic nutrients and timing hacks. We're gonna to try to unjam the signals. We're gonna to try to reverse the process and realistically reclaim energy and the ability for your cells to use fuel. I wanna get one thing straight right away. Okay, insulin resistance and diabetes are not the same thing. Insulin resistance is the long smoldering fire and type two diabetes is when the house is actually burning down. Okay, both can be course corrected, but a heck of a lot easier to handle it when it's in the insulin resistance stage, okay? So when you eat, your blood sugar goes up. Your pancreas then releases insulin and that's like a key that's supposed to unlock your muscle cells and supposed to let the sugar in for energy. So in insulin resistance, essentially your muscle cells start to ignore the key and the lock gets kind of rusty. So what does your body do? Well, it doesn't give up. Your pancreas just works overtime, right? So it pumps out more insulin. It keeps trying harder, trying to force the rusty lock open. So for years, this compensation works, right? Sometimes not quite years, but sometimes even decades it'll work. Your blood sugar might look normal on a standard test, but underneath your insulin levels are raging and not everyone goes and gets like a fasting insulin test and a lot of people don't even know what to look for there. So this is the critical phase that so many people are in. You feel the symptoms, you feel the fatigue, you feel the brain fog, you feel the weight gain, you feel the spongy fat building, but your doctors will say your fasting glucose is fine because that's like the preliminary thing they look at, but it's because your body is screaming with insulin to keep that number down. You're fighting a war, but no one is acknowledging the battle. So insulin's doing all this work to keep this fasting blood glucose at a normal level. You might end up thinking that this is a problem for older, like overweight people, but the data actually shows otherwise. And that's what can be really scary. There was an interesting study that was published in the journal Clinical Endocrinology Metabolism. So it looked at middle-aged people or young to middle-aged, 18 to 44. They found that 44.8% of these young adults had insulin resistance. And here's the kicker. Half of those people are not even obese. Let me repeat that. Literally millions of young, lean people are walking around with a metabolic disease that they don't even know they have. We're talking about quite a phenomenon, okay? It's called the thin outside, fat inside phenomenon. The risks aren't trivial either. So we've been conditioned to fear LDL cholesterol, but study after study, like one in diabetes and metabolic syndrome, has shown that insulin resistance is a more powerful predictor of cardiovascular disease than LDL. Let me repeat that. Okay, insulin resistance is a more powerful predictor of cardiovascular disease than LDL. Okay, the damage starts even earlier though. So when all that sugar is stuck in your bloodstream, it leads to this process called glycation. So glycation, it's like thinking of your insides slowly caramelizing. I've talked about this in a bunch of videos before. The sugar molecules that are in your bloodstream literally get sticky and start gumming up your proteins, they start gumming up your blood vessels, they start gumming up collagen. It really is what accelerates aging, it damages your organs, it messes up your kidneys, it stiffens your arteries. This is a root issue and so many people just wanna focus on one thing. Like they'll focus on LDL or they'll focus on saturated fat. In reality, it's a collective issue that's going on with our inability to use fuel 
when we're looking at insulin resistance. This is where a powerful compound like carnosine can come in though. Carnosine is really interesting because it acts like sort of the sacrificial shield. I've talked about this in other videos before. It's kind of an interesting just supplement to add into the mix, right? So it essentially intercepts those sticky sugar molecules because those can end up doing permanent damage to your tissue. So it blocks them before they hit there. And it's a crucial defense. So it kind of stops the collateral damage of the high blood sugar. So, I mean, that's something that you could easily add into the mix just as a quick hit, right? So adding that to the mix, maybe, you know, three to six grams of that stuff. So really not a ridiculous amount, but it's something that's effective when it comes to glycation, like having it with a high carb meal. So what is actually causing the cellular breakdown? So the answer lies in this tiny little doorway that's on your muscle cells. We've talked about this before. You've heard me talk about GLUT4. So imagine your muscle cell is a garage, okay? Glucose is the car that needs to get inside to be used for fuel, okay? That garage door is something that we'll call the GLUT4 transporter. That's what it is. Insulin is like the remote control for that garage door. So in a healthy person, you eat, insulin is released, it hits the garage door button, and the garage door opens, and the glucose car drives right in, plain and simple. But in insulin resistance, the signal from the remote is being jammed, okay? So inflammation is usually blocking that signal. So the glucose cars pile up outside in the bloodstream, causing all that glycation damage that we just talked about. So what's jamming the signal? Well, there are leading researchers like Dr. Gerald Schulman, that's at Yale, he's been pointing to one culprit. I've studied his work for a while. So he published something in Physiological Reviews. It was this fat-derived metabolite that's called diacylglycerol, or DAG for short. Now, I want you to think of DAGs as a thick, sticky sludge that has been seeped into the garage door's receiver. Okay, so it's basically, it's caused by overnutrition. So basically when you're eating too much or when you have too much of two different fuels or three different fuels coming in. So when your primary fat cells get overstuffed, they actually leak fatty acids into your muscles and your liver. Okay, so inside the muscle, these fats are converted into that signal jamming sludge, this DAG, and the signal's blocked. Okay, this is something that people haven't been looking at. They've been blaming glucose, but it's really about what's happening from our fat cells. So I wanna get into the actionable steps. Okay, what's the first thing that you can do? If your garage door gets stuck, what do you do? Like if your opener doesn't work, you open the door manually, right? The horrible energy crash that you get after a meal, feeling super weak or really tired where you're not able to get a workout in or anything, a lot of times that is just your receiver, your remote, not working. You need to have a manual override for the garage door. And this is something literally as simple as a 15 or 20 minute walk after your meal. The muscle contraction activates this secondary pathway. I've talked about it before. It's called AMPK, which forces the GLUT4 doors open. So this bypasses insulin entirely. This is your manual door opener. I know it sounds simple, but you have to do it. But you can also take it to the next level, okay? Since exercise opens the garage door without insulin, this is the one time you can strategically use carbohydrates to your advantage. So if you have a small amount of fast digesting carbs during your actual resistance training workout, it allows you to shuttle that glucose directly into the working muscle and you're able to use it for immediate fuel. So you're not causing a big insulin spike contributing to more of the problem. You're literally force feeding your muscles for a better workout while the rest of your body remains insulin sensitive, which is exactly what you need. You need to have that insulin sensitivity. So this is how you have the energy to train hard, which in turn helps you burn more fat and fix the underlying problem. But then there's something that's called the fat gas tank theory. This is really interesting because one thing that I always wonder and other people wonder is why do I get insulin resistance when my friend is eating junk food all day and does not get it? And here we turn to a study that was published in Nature Genetics. And it shows that our genetics give us different fat storage capacities. And on one hand, it's sort of, I don't know, disappointing and discouraging. But on the other hand, it teaches us more about ourselves and how we can navigate it. So these fat storage capacities, think of it as like a gas tank. Some people have a huge tank, others have a tiny one. And with insulin resistance, this makes a very big difference. So even one small amount of overeating causes an overflow of these fatty acids that floods the muscles and creates that DAG sludge in the clicker, right? So how do we take care of this? So the actionable step we need to take here is we need to slow down some of the, the fuel going into the tank. So you need to slow the rate at which the food is actually coming in. And the best way you can do this is with protein and soluble fiber. And I know it's things that we've talked about before. I know it's not earth shattering, but I'm gonna get into more details. Acacia fiber, 
psyllium husk, uh, chia seeds, if you just mix them in some water or some milk and let them swell up, this slows the absorption of carbs and fats. It turns a fire hose of fuel into a gentle stream. Basically, it's preventing the overflow. So it's not about the fiber. I mean, the fiber, sure, it's great for the gut, but we are literally talking about slowing the stream of fuel in so that DAG does not happen. Because it's not just about glucose. It's about an overabundance of fuel. I get kind of creative with my fiber sometimes. A lot of times I'll use psyllium and I'll put it in cottage cheese. Sometimes I put it in yogurt because I don't need much. And at the end of the day, like I was insulin resistant for a long time. So I still add fiber and protein in. So I'll take yogurt, I'll put a little bit of psyllium, and then I'll also put a little bit of like whey protein and mix it in there with like a little bit of monk fruit. I uh, put a link down below for Thrive Market. They have really good psyllium and really good fiber choices, but that link is for 30% off your entire grocery order. So what Thrive is, is an online grocery store. So having the right foods stocked in your house is one of the most important things because you're gonna reach for something that's actually good. So they literally reject thousands of ingredients. So brands come to them and they'll say, no, we won't carry you in our store because of the ingredients you have. It's the way that Quite frankly, it should be because sometimes we just let too much garbage in. So huge kudos and shout out to them for actually standing up and doing that. So the stuff that's on their site, that's in their store, is stuff that's been vetted and stuff that I would eat. So you can go and check out high fiber stuff, high protein stuff, all stuff that's relevant to this video. So that link down below, 30% off your full grocery order and a free gift. So I highly recommend you check them out. They've been a supporter of this channel for almost a decade. So link in the top line of the description underneath this video. Then we need to get into the next pragmatic thing that you can do. Vacuum out that sludge that's gumming everything up. I remember feeling like my metabolism was fundamentally broken. Like I remember it's done, like nothing works. I eat protein, it doesn't build my muscle. I eat carbs, I just gain fat. I don't have energy when I eat. I literally feel fundamentally broken. What you have to do is you have to clean out that existing DAG sludge we talked about. Obviously consistent exercise does this because it increases fat burning, but hear me out on how this actually works. I want you to think of it as turning on an industrial strength sludge vacuum inside your muscle cells. But what if you could, let's say for example, have like a stronger vacuum cleaner. This is where something like TMG, I've talked about TMG a lot. It's called trimethylglycine. TMG supports the mitochondrial function and it activates that same AMPK pathway that we've been talking about. So by improving the health of your cellular power plants, it helps your body actually get better at burning the excess fatty acids for fuel. This way they're not turning into DAGs in the first place. It prevents them from backing up and it helps the cleanup crew actually do its job. But then we actually need to mimic the key. That's the next simple step. And it's such a simple spice that you can add it. I, again, I remember feeling like my body was ignoring insulin. Like even once I got a grasp on the biochemistry, I'm like, how come my insulin levels are high when I get a blood test done? And how come my body's ignoring it? But there's really cool things. You can actually get that rusty lock we talked about to work better. And one of the best studied examples is literally cinnamon. So cinnamon has these compounds in it that act as what are called insulin mimetics. So they don't replace insulin, but what they do is they help the actual insulin receptor that receives the insulin to become more sensitive to the signal. So a little bit of Ceylon cinnamon, gotta make sure you use the right kind of cinnamon here, like a quarter teaspoon in your coffee, or just literally on your food, whatever, mixed in yogurt, can be a really simple, powerful tool to make the insulin that you're producing more effective. So all these things we're kinda putting in place here, we gotta make it more effective. And then we look at the big step. We gotta hit the master reset button. It's like when your phone is really glitching out and weird, you do a hard reset on it. It's really tough when you're feeling super overwhelmed, you don't know where to start, and sometimes it's easier to just hit the master reset, hit the hard reset, and then implement all these things that I'm talking about. So the most powerful tool that we have to directly counteract overnutrition is literally to just stop eating. I mean, fasting for a little bit of time is the master reset button. When you fast, you're not just restricting calories. I mean, yes, you are, but that's not the main thing. You're literally flipping powerful genetic switches. And I've had the top experts on this channel come here and talk about this stuff. This is real. Don't let other people tell you that it's just about calories. There are other things going on. Sure, calories are the big one. That is the biggest piece, but there are other genetic things going on. Literal epigenetic switches. You dramatically lower insulin. It just gives your cells a much needed break so that it knows how to produce insulin in the future. It cranks up AMPK, which we were talking about. It cranks up autophagy. Again, that's your body's cellular cleanup. It's the recycling process that actually clears out those DAGs. It clears out the sludge that we were talking about. So you ultimately end up forcing your body to become more efficient at burning the stored fat. 
even just literally just fasting for 16 hours and eating for eight. That in and of itself can begin to reverse years of damage by just giving your body the time it needs to heal. I tried for so long to try different things. I tried just six meals a day. I tried reducing calories and just three meals a day. I tried over -ex None of it worked, but fasting worked. And sometimes it's psychological, but it's simple. But there's an interesting twist, and I don't want us always to kind of smash insulin resistance as a bad thing, because sometimes it's a survival tool. What if I told you that insulin resistance is actually a mechanism that can help spare glucose for important things? During fasting, your body intelligently makes your muscles insulin resistant in order to spare glucose for your brain. So the tragedy is that our state of constant overnutrition tricks our body into triggering this ancient program. So the flood of fatty acids from overeating mimics the flood of fatty acids from fasting. So when we are not eating and fasting, our body releases fatty acids. So it actually creates a temporary insulin resistance, but it's the kind of insulin resistance we need, whereas it's similar when we overeat and we have fatty acids coming into our bloodstream, your body thinks it's starving. So it actually makes you insulin resistant. That's the interesting twist. It's starving, it thinks it's starving, but you're just becoming more insulin resistant as a result. So you're not broken. Your body is just doing what it's designed to do based on the wrong signals from our modern environment, period. By simply taking a walk after meals, by using fiber, by leveraging tools like TMG, by using cinnamon, by hitting the reset button with occasional fasting, by using carnosine, okay, you are literally sending the right signals. You're telling your body, we are fueled, open the doors, let the energy in. I did a complete video talking about how to intermittent fast and how things have changed in the recent years. So more up-to-date things. So if you're looking at getting started on that or you just need a refresher, go ahead and hit that link right there. I put the video right there. It's a great place to start. So hopefully this video helped you understand. So hit that subscribe button, hit the little bell icon, and I will see you tomorrow.